the game. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm going to set my timer. Because I promised you guys, every time we do this, my goal is that we can cover this material in 30 minutes. Say yes if you believe that. <laughs> Those of you who know me are like, yeah, right, Dr. Sure. That's the challenge, right? You know, what I like to do is I like to show these younger doctors that, you know, you can get, you can rip through all this material, so they, they have a running bet that I can't do it. All right. <laughs> so uh, tonight we've got a, uh, a really serious, really important topic. Um, how many of you know people that are uh, diagnosed with heart disease? Uh, you should raise your hand because almost everybody, right? So there's a huge, huge percentage of Americans today that are, are suffering with this very serious condition. Uh, and this should bother everybody, uh, especially when you start seeing the numbers and how significant it is. We're talking about 26 and a half million Americans have heart disease. One million heart attacks plus are happening every year in just the U.S. Every 33 seconds, someone in the U.S. dies from heart disease. And there's 600,000 or more deaths now. Um, it's the number one cause of death of your friends, your family, the people that you know and care about. The number one cause of death of men and the number one cause of death of women. All right? um, I put this stat up in my room today. Uh, this was written up on the dry erase board because uh, I wanted to just stimulate some thought from people. How many, uh, how many people know what this 1 in 31 versus 1 in 3 uh, ratio indicates? What are any guesses there? What do you think the 1 in 31 number is? These are the projections of women that will die from breast cancer a year. Is one in 31. It's a, it's a big number, right? It's a staggering number. And technically, what it means is they're anything associated with breast cancer, not just breast cancer itself, but the treatments, right? Because there's some pretty horrific treatments that get done in this situation. Right? So it's deaths related to breast cancer and the treatment of breast cancer. What do you think the number of one in three is? Heart disease. The number of women that are dying today from heart disease, one in three. Staggering, isn't it? Did you guys notice that there was a good deal of consciousness here in the last several months? Have you noticed the pink ribbons everywhere and mm -hmm. lots of hoopla, lots of excitement, lots of energy going in that direction with research and funding and you know walks for the cure and all this and there's pink ribbons on everything, on eggs and on shirts and on you know bumpers so everywhere you look, right? And it's one in 31. Not that that's not something we need to take a good hard look at, but one in three women are dying today of heart disease. Okay, so it's a shocker, isn't it? So this is something that is ubiquitous and it's affecting our population in huge percentages. And the real challenge here is this is nearly 100% preventable. Okay, so what we're going to talk about here tonight is information that you're probably not hearing everywhere else because it's there is a lot of promotion that goes on around heart disease, but usually it's in what category? In the pharmaceutical category, right? And it's usually like if you got high blood pressure, take this and this. If you got high cholesterol, take this and this and this, right? And uh, you know we've got beta blockers. We, we've got we've got more drugs than we know what to do with, right? There's an interesting statistic that just came out that the United States today is taking over 85 percent of the pharmaceuticals in the world, and we represent less than five percent of the world's population. Eighty-five percent consumed by less than five percent of the world's population. Okay? And that would be fine and good, and be something that we could look at and be like, well, look at that. We have got this. Uh, we have the availability of this type of healthcare, right? And that's why we're the healthiest nation, right? Do you think we're the healthiest nation? No. We're not, right? So you know, the World Health Organization uh, value, uh, <laughs> evaluates the health of uh, the developed world, right? And out of the 40 top to developed countries, where do you think the United States sits this year? Yes. Number 40. 41. We're the, low, we're the lowest one on the list, okay? Which is a shocker, right? Because we spend more money than anyone. You know, we've got over a $2 trillion a year. That's a T, trillion. Do the numbers get silly? Do you guys just kind of lose track of it? We've got a $2 trillion a year chronic disease healthcare burden on us right now. And that makes us number one in spending on the world. And we spend more than double the next country, okay? Something's wrong, right? Something's broken. So let's, tonight I'm going to try to bring to you information, like, like I said, that you're not hearing everywhere else. Okay, so we're not just going to beat the same old drum. I'm going to bring you strategies. I'm going to bring you some, uh, some of the, what the research is telling us the healthiest people in the world are doing. Okay, so that you can either prevent getting heart disease entirely, or if you have already been struck with heart disease, then it's something that you can actually reverse. Okay, 
So I, I brought up this graphic at a workshop I taught the other night. This is actually something that I brought with me to Sydney when I was speaking in Australia uh, 10 days ago. Uh, this here is a graphic representation of daily U.S. cardiac deaths from 1973 to 2001. So this is about a 30 year span here, okay? And it's a study, if you look at the bottom here, look at this date over here. July 1st is way over here, and then June 30th over here, which makes this what? January 1st right here, so New Year's. So what is this in here? See the Christmas season, New Year's season? So here's our holiday season. Look at the spike in the number of deaths throughout the year. Isn't that extraordinary? You know, so we look at that and we wonder, you know, what is going on there? And we're going to unpack that here tonight. Um, because it's Thanksgiving, and I know you guys thought I was cool doing this workshop just before Thanksgiving, I thought you'd appreciate this. It's not as much what you do between Thanksgiving and New Year's as what you do between New Year's and Thanksgiving. All right, so what is, what is creating this massive spike here? What are some thoughts? What are some of the things that are extraordinary about this time of the year uh, that might lead to uh, this type of manifestation and, and increase in heart attacks. What do you guys think? Stress. Stress. Okay, Stress. so in what form, right? Think about think about what we're faced at this time of the year, and it just it just kind of peaks. It just kills. It build, builds and builds and builds, and then it starts to taper off, right? So think about it. What do we have? Limited time, energy, focus, and money, right? So that's our. Those are your limited resources: your time, your energy, your focus, and your money. What gets stressed this time of the year? All of them, all of them right? Them. And all at once, right? So I'll suggest that most Americans and probably most in people in the modern developed world, we're all operating filled to the brim, right? I think people are just continually stressed to the point where they're just maxed out, right? Do you feel like you're like maxed out in the time category? Maxed out in how much energy can you possibly put out? Money, we all know where that's gone, right? So everybody is just maxed out before the holidays arrive. Okay? And then you start throwing in all these additional time obligations, the hustle, the bustle, and then there's the gift buying and all the expenses associated with it. And then you throw in the in-laws, and you, you know, you, it's all this is the confluence of multiple, you know, the collision of dysfunctional systems, everything comes together, and we see this type of stress, right? So big spikes here in stress, uh, which result in an overload in the system and, you know, heart attacks. So, we talk about hormones tonight. We're going to talk about the hormone cortisol. Okay, so we're going to focus this workshop around cortisol because it's a stress hormone. Yes, everybody understand that? Okay, so cortisol. Are stress hormones bad? No, stress hormones are wonderful and they help us survive for sure. But the problem is, is that we were designed to live a certain way and we're now living another way that is totally against the owner's manual. And one thing, one of the consequences of that is that last graphic that we saw. And the big player involved here is cortisol. So I want everybody to say this with me. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Say that. Stress hormone. Okay. So like when we say insulin is the fat storage hormone, right? Cortisol is the stress hormone. Okay. So you guys got that? So what creates chronically elevated cortisol? Well, we're going to talk about the limited exertion, uh, which is the sedentary lifestyle. People just aren't moving to the point of exertion. Chronic psychological stresses, which is the headspace thought life stuff. Sleep deprivation, right? How many people are just chronically exhausted, right? We're just dialing it back in that category. Most people are not getting enough street sleep. And the fourth one is vertebral subluxation, which we'll unpack here for you tonight, which for you to understand what creates chronically elevated cortisol. So what, what is cortisol and how does it work in the body? What is physiologically what happens when you have um, elevated cortisol? Uh, cortisol or other stress hormones. So this is the way your physiology is designed. Uh, we have this part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. And your autonomic nervous system has two settings. It has sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, sympathetic is your stressed state, your fight or flight response. Say yes if you understand that. Right? That's sympathetic fight or flight. The opposite of that is parasympathetic, which is the rest, repair, and reproduction. Okay, so that's parasympathetic. It's a lot like a car, and driving a body is a lot dri like driving a car. Cars are either in what? They're in drive, or they're in reverse, or they're stuck in park, right? Now you can't be in drive, and you can't be in reverse at the same time, all right? So you're either in drive, or you're in reverse, okay? Think about that the same way with your autonomic nervous system. You're either in fight or flight, or you're in rest and repair. Say yes if you get it, okay? 
hormones, uh, your nerve system, the coordinated the nerve system, the endocrine system, your hormone systems determine whether you're in fight or flight or when you're in rest and repair. All right? So if you're in a situation like this poor little seal where the shark is chasing him right out of the water, um, fortunately in my trip to Australia, in my two days of surfing, I only was chased out of the water one time by one shark. Uh, so I fully appreciate what that, what that seal is, is feeling right there. But the acute stress, what happens? Imagine you were designed to, or the way we're designed is you were down at the water hole, let's say it's 50,000 years ago, and you were just fetching water, right? And all of a sudden, a lion jumped out of the woods at you, right? The appropriate physiological response would be for your body to spike your stress hormone so you could either fight or flee, right? I recommend flee in this situation. Just get out of there, right? So what happens is there's a surge and a change in your body chemistry and your stress hormones spike. And the stress hormones like cortisol, the catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, when these hormones start raging through your system, it changes your physiology entirely and that physiology is now appropriate for you to either fight or flee. You guys get it? Okay. So these are the things that we see happen. There's a stimulation, your physiology changes, you release stress hormones, uh, uh, and your body goes into a fight or flight physiology. So this is what you see in this type of physiology, or this adaptive physiology. Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, blood sugar goes up, blood lipids go up, and clotting factors in your blood go up. Think about that. Why would your blood pressure go up? You got to fight or flee, right? You need that pumping to, so you can get out of there. Heart rate's going to go up to push the blood out to your muscles so you can get out of there, right? Blood sugar. Your blood sugar is going to go up because you need energy substrates to burn so that you can either fight or flee, right? So it down regulates or turns down your insulin sensitivity, okay? So your blood sugar stays high. Blood lipids go up. In other words, your body dumps lipids and fats into your bloodstream, again, for an energy substrate so you can burn energy to get out of there. And then clotting factors go up. Think about that blood clotting factors. What if you get bit by that tiger or get grabbed by that shark? You want blood clotting factors so you don't bleed out. Does this all make sense to you guys? And a totally appropriate physiological response when a lion jumps out of the wood at you, right? Your eyes dilate, your muscles contract, your breathing rate increases, you need more ex oxygen, right? Your focus narrows, your vision and hearing sharpens, long-term memory is reduced. Your immune system is down-regulated, okay? Think about that. The immune system is a very expensive system physiologically, right? Your immune system uses lots of energy, which is why if you get overtired, your immune system goes down and you're more susceptible to get sick, right? The immune system takes a lot of body energy. But if you're going to be running away from a lion or swimming away from a shark, you're not going to be wanting to spend energy trying to fight off germs. You need to get out of dodge, right? So that energy gets diverted from your immune system to your muscular system. You guys get it? Okay. Now, if you get bit later on, your musculoskeletal system will be downregulated when you're resting and repairing, and your immune system will get upregulated so you can fight the infection. Make sense? Body pretty smart or stupid? Smart or stupid, guys? Very smart, right? Very smart, okay? So the immune system gets down-regulated. Digestion, is digestion going to speed up or slow down? With the exception of defecation possibly in this situation, your, your digestion is going to slow down. You're not going to be wanting to put energy into digesting your lunch, right? You're just trying not to be lunch, right? So you're shutting down the digestive tract, right? So slow down the digestion. Reproduction is, should be the last thing on your mind right now, right? So that gets down-regulated. Think about what that does to the body, right? Totally appropriate. It's all about all the energy should get into fight or flee. All hormone-driven. You know what? This system is beautiful. And it's perfect if, you, if, you're, if you're able to get away from your perceived threat. Okay? It's not meant to be sustained. You're supposed to be able to get away. It's supposed to be short-lived. Think about it. You either successfully get away from the tiger or you don't. <laughs> not designed to be a long-standing system. Say yes, you get that, right? So it's supposed to be boom, boom, right? Now, what happens if your situation is that you're stuck in a bad situation and you can't get away? What if it's a bad job or a bad boss or a bad relationship and you're just stuck there, okay? Right? Think about this. You can't get away, so think about this chronically sustained stressor. Again, this is a perceived threat. Your job is driving you nuts, or the relationship with your boss, or something else has got you just driving, right? And your cortisol is charging through your bloodstream all the time. You're in fight or flight all the time. You're in the stress response all the time. Guess what? 
Stress response is stress response is stress response. Your body just, when you release those catecholamines, you release that cortisol, you release those stress hormones, your body does the exact same thing. Look at it. Blood pressure goes up. Heart rate goes up. Blood sugar goes up. Blood lipids, it's the exact same physiology. Immune system, down-regulated. Digestion slows down. Reproduction, shut down. Chronically sustained stress. This is what chronic, chronically high cortisol does to your body. What does that sound like? A heart attack waiting to happen, a stroke waiting to happen, blood pressure up, heart rate up, blood sugar elevated, blood lipids, cholesterol, circulating lipids, elevated, clotting factors, elevated, chronic psychological stress. You guys get it? Yep. Your body doesn't know the difference. So what is cardiovascular disease? So everybody talks about heart disease, so I'm just going to go over this. Bear with me, guys. I'm going to go over some a bit of physiology here, as if the parasympathetic, sympathetic warm up, stretch out was enough for you. All right, so here's the cardiovascular disease picture. So here's your blood vessels, right? So imagine this is an arterial, uh, an artery, right? So we're taking an artery and we're slicing it down. The artery is where the oxygenated blood travels from your heart out to your body, right? The veins is when it returns, right? So the, if you look at an artery, it's a muscular tube, right? Picture it like a garden hose and we just shoom, chop it, so this is called a transection, right? So when we're looking at this, there's three layers. The outside of the hose is this thin layer, that's like a sausage covering, okay? The inner layer is this muscular um, layer that, that will contract and dilate, so contraction and dilation, okay? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an involuntary muscle that will control and influence blood pressure and blood flow, okay? So this is a muscular layer. And then there's a thin layer inside there that forms a, a protective lining between the blood that's in the hose, in the tube, okay, and that muscular layer. Now this is key for you to understand. The muscular layer, the middle layer, does not like to be exposed to blood. Doesn't like to be exposed to oxygenated blood. There's a lining inside of that hose that protects that muscular layer. You guys get the visual? Okay, three layers. And the blood's coursing through this tube with a lumen. Okay? Now, when blood pressure goes up, or blood sugar goes up, or toxin levels in your bloodstreams go up, they create this stress inside of your blood vessels that creates these cracks on the inside wall of that, that thin layer and starts to crack that thin layer away that protects the muscular middle layer and exposes that muscular layer to an oxygenated bloodstream, okay? which remember, the muscles don't like that. Okay? That protective layer starts cracking open and exposing the muscle below it, and those are called nicks. Right? So there's certain things that will cause nicks. When your blood pressure goes up, it'll create nicks. Think of it like cracks on the inside of a garden hose. Blood sugar, when you have chronically elevated blood sugar, like in what? Diabetes. Diabetes. Okay? Type 1 or type 2 by diabetes, or if you just have elevated uh, blood sugar and you're hypoglycemic, okay, when you're, when you're borderline hypoglycemic, excuse me, you have, have chronically elevated blood sugar, okay, when you have high blood sugar, the blood sugar, picture sugar granules, okay, they look like little cubes, right, on a molecular level, they've got little corners and points like that, picture them running, r rolling right through your bloodstream, and they're just nicking and scratching and cutting open the inside of that lumen, inside of that blood vessel, do you guys picture this? Okay, so when you open that layer up and explode, expose that muscle, the, the body responds. Is the body smart or stupid, guys? <laughs> smart. Okay, the body responds. Okay, there's a few things that are released into the bloodstream. Things like cholesterol. Okay, one thing that happens is the body will, will produce cholesterol, LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol will go to the site of this opening and this irritation trying to patch it up. Okay? There's also an immune response that's mounted by the body. Right? So the LDL cholesterols with the low density lipoproteins are the very small cholesterol particles and the HDL or high density lipoproteins are the big cholesterol. So both of these are innately appropriate. Right? The body's smart. It produces what you need. In the, in the appropriate amounts to respond to an urgent situation, okay? The situation's the problem, not the body's response to the situation. Say yes if you get that, mm -hmm. okay? So we have high blood pressure, we have toxins like nicotine, okay? 
uh, or caffeine. We have toxins or chemicals that are in the bloodstream. Uh, and we have high sugar that could scratch up the inside of the linings of the blood vessels. That creates exposure and irritation, and the body produces cholesterol in response to the exposed muscle to try to come and save the day, so to speak. Now, what happens is this cholesterol, uh, the LDL cholesterol and the HDL cholesterol come together. There's an immune response, and unfortunately, what happens is the body tends to overreact Okay, in a situation. It's like that's a serious situation. The body's trying to stabilize that, and you'll end up with an immune response, and we end up with calcification of that, of that wound, of that area, and we end up with placking of the arteries. Okay? So in placking of the arteries, what happens is we start layering on plaques, and as we layer on plaques, the lumen of that blood vessel gets smaller. So when the lumen gets more narrow, what happens? Pressure goes what? Up. Pressure goes up. Okay, so now blood pressure goes up, which is what led to some of the cracks to begin with, right? So now we end up with this downward spiral. You guys see this? Okay, I'm trying to keep it kind of top level so I don't lose you guys. Are you guys following me on this, all right? So we end up with the combination of the cholesterol placking, uh, the immune response, and the calcification. And we end up with situations like clotting. Um, if clots break, we end up with um, uh, strokes, and embolus, uh, heart attacks, etc. So this is this is why heart disease is such a, such a serious situation. And remember, it, cortisol is one of the stress hormones that will drive that blood pressure up. You guys get the relationship here, okay? So as our stress levels increase and our cortisol levels increase, our blood pressure goes up, our insulin sensitivity goes down, so now our blood sugar goes up, and we start this downward cycle. And the body's responding, trying to do the best it can to save you. So we end up with this chronic low-grade inflammatory process in the body. So what we see and we identify as heart disease downstream is the body's innately appropriate response to a low-grade inflammatory situation inside your blood vessels. Did we get that? Did you guys understand that? Mm -hmm. It's really important that you understand the problem because you cannot manage the problem pro pro properly if you don't understand and appreciate what's going on there. So in our clinic, we work really hard. The doctors and our team, frankly, work really hard to make sure that you guys are understanders. I'm not interested in creating a bunch of believers. Okay, I want people to be understanders. I want you to understand your physiology because it's my belief that people who understand their body just take better care of it. Say yes if you believe that. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so what creates chronically elevated cortisol? Limited exertion, psychological stress and sleep deprivation, and vertebral subluxation. I'm going to take these first three and just put it on this very simple energy graph for you guys. Imagine this is your energy graph. Here's zero, which would be just dead. Here's 100% <laughs> exertion, okay? So here we've got three categories. Can you guys see me over there? I'm sorry. So you've got sleep, you've got social stress, and you've got exertion in these three zones. You guys get it? Okay. The way our physiology, the way our endocrine system is designed is there are, there are waxes and wanes and shifts and changes and cycles in our hormones. You guys understand that, right? And the body, um, the energy cycles of the body are very much dependent on and, or I should say, interdependent on your, the energy cycles, hormones and energy, okay? So when we look at your sleep patterns, your social stresses and exertion, there's innately appropriate hormone shifts and levels in here, all right? Now, there's two places where our hormones get rebooted and our hormone systems and our, and our endocrine system get reset and rebooted, and it's during sleep and during exertion, okay? Those are two places where our metabolism and our hormonal systems get balanced and rebooted. Do you guys get that? We are, we are designed to sleep, and we are designed to move. We're hunters and gatherers, right? So we're supposed to be moving and we're supposed to be sleeping, right? I'll suggest that in our modern culture, what we see is people spend very little time in here and very little time in here and most of their time in here, okay? We are now sleep deprived, terribly sleep deprived, and most people are living a highly sedentary lifestyle and they're not exerting themselves so they're not experiencing correction of their metabolic derangement, okay? So most people have a metabolic derangement, things like insulin sensitivity issues. 
And one way to reboot your insulin sensitivity, in other words, how sensitive your cells are to insulin so you can take the, the sugar out of your bloodstream and into your cells, one way you reboot your sensitivity with your insulin is through exertion, through exercise. Okay? It's called metabolic conditioning or Metcon. All right? Because most people are not exerting themselves anymore and they're not sleeping anymore, they're staying in this chronically elevated social stress box, so they end up with this tragic metabolic derangement that's not getting reconciled through these two uh, bookends, if you will. How many people understand that? You guys get that? Mm -hmm. All right. So here we are, we're stuck in this uh, social stress with highly elevated cortisol. All right. Who, str who struggles with, um, with sleep? Anybody? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Who struggles with exertion? Not getting their butt moving, working out enough. Merry Christmas. And who's stuck here in this one? Social stress. Don't be shy. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Study for the folks, please. All right. Let's talk about the big idea. All right, so what does this have to do with chiropractic? Because don't forget, we're in a chiropractic clinic. So this is your spine, right? And everybody knows this is your pseudorubber, right? What do we mean by it's a pseudorubber? Is your body smart or stupid? Smart. So there's an intelligence in your body, right? So there's an intelligence that runs your body and that keeps your body healthy. And it's the intelligence that heals your body, right? That innate intelligence courses across which system in your body? A nervous system, right? So if you want to be healthy, you have to have a healthy nervous system. If you want to have a healthy nervous system, you have to have a healthy spine. Because your spine is the suit of armor that protects your nervous system. Okay? So we all know the most important organ in the body is the what? Spine. <laughs> I love the way you're thinking. But it's the what? Brain. The brain, right? So many people say heart, but it's not the heart because they do heart replacement, right? I don't know if anybody's ever had a, a, a brain replacement, although a, a, brain, a, a brain transplant, I should say, although there's plenty of candidates, especially in Gloucester. <laughs> All right, so this, the brain is the most important organ in the body, right, because it runs the body, right? The brain is actually listening to the rest of the body, and it's listening to the signals that come to it across the spinal cord and nervous system. And then the brain acts like a master computer that tells the body what to do and how to respond and how to relate to the environment so that we can be healthy, okay? Wellness is to be able to adapt readily and appropriately to stressors, okay? So if you want to experience wellness, you better have a nervous system that's operating without any interference, okay? So God, the very smart designer of this body, designed it in such a way that the brain was protected by a skull, okay? So it's a bony vault that protects it, right? Now, if you look at the bottom of the skull, there's a hole. Okay, where the brain stem comes out, okay, that's called the foramen magnum, which is Latin for big hole. Okay? That's where the brain stem comes through, and it goes into this spinal column. If you look at the spinal column, the spinal column is a very sophisticated series of joints. It's 24 joints that stack up on top of each other. And when you look at them from a bird's eye view, they form a tube of bone, and that tube of bone has a spinal cord inside of there. The spinal cord is just a continuation of the brain. Okay? It goes all the way through, and at each one of these disc levels is a nerve root that comes out. One goes right, one goes left. They branch off and they become your nerve system to feed your body. So your body talks to your brain as to what it needs to relate to the environment so it can adapt readily and appropriately, and your brain tells the body what to do and how to behave. The spinal column, if you look at it straight from behind, straight away or from behind, should be, should be straight up and down, right? Straight is strong, all right? Now, if you take a straw and you push at it from the top to the bottom and it's straight, it what? nice and strong. But if it's got a bend in it, you push on it from top to bottom, what happens? It fails, right? So it should be straight up and down. When you look at the spine from the side, however, there's a critical series of curves, and these curves act like a spring to protect your spine, to protect the spine so that the spine can protect the nervous system inside of it, right? So at each one of these joint levels is a disc. So you get a vertebrae and a disc and a vertebrae. These discs are critical, and that's what needs to be protected. These discs are spacers that allow these nerve roots to come out of the spine at each joint level. One goes right, one goes left. If you want these nerves to be able to breathe and have lots of room, you have to have a big, fat, healthy discs in each one of these vertebral joints. Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. That's how you're designed to stay healthy. 
Body talks to the brain, brain talks to the, bo talks to the body. Now, that spine will last you a lifetime, and this body is actually designed, physiologists will tell us that the body is actually designed to go 120 years. How many 120 year olds do you know? None. Right? Exactly. Things start to break down, right? So when things start to break down or go sideways, what happens is we end up with a problem called subluxation. Okay? Subluxation occurs when the spinal joint gets jarred out of a healthy position. Just like a sprained ankle, when you take a joint and jar it out of a healthy position, it creates soft tissue damage. That damage creates swelling. The swelling creates pressure on the nerves that are trying to leave the spine at each joint level. Okay? Those discs, specifically, and the connective tissues and soft tissues in the joint start to swell and irritate that nerve. When you irritate a nerve, bad things happen. Most importantly, you change the information that's going across the nerve. Remember, it's that flow of information that keeps you healthy and is what heals your body. That's what coordinates all that intelligence that we talked about in the body. Everybody with me? Okay. That's called subluxation. When you damage soft tissue like that and create nerve irritation, this is what happens. The joint gets jarred out of alignment, okay, either through bad habits or trauma or both, guys. Joint gets misaligned, it creates soft tissue damage, just like a sprained ankle, it swells. That swelling puts pressure on the nerve and creates nerve irritation. When that brain senses that nerve irritation, there's muscle spasms around the joint because is your body smart or stupid? Smart. Those muscles tighten up around that joint to protect it and splint. Splint that joint so you don't do more damage. Okay? So it keeps you from moving around so that you don't damage that disc further and cause more problems and more trouble and more inflammation and nerve irritation. Pretty smart, huh? Well, why do we as smart people take pills to relax those muscles that are spasming out to protect us and then take pain pills so that we don't even feel the symptoms that we're in trouble, right? Smart or stupid, okay? Yeah. So this is what you see people doing, right? So those muscle spasms protect you. You get joint fixation from the swelling, so you lose your range of motion, okay? Eventually, you might end up with pain, or if it's an acute trauma, you might feel the pain right away. And here's the big one, guys. Look what happens. When you create nerve irritation and inflammation, you produce stress hormones, specifically cortisol. What does cortisol do? It's the stress hormone, right? Remember the fight or flight adaptive physiology, okay? What does it do to your blood pressure? Up. What does it do to your heart rate? Up. What does it do to your blood sugar? Up. What does it do to your clotting factors? Up. What does it do to your immune system? Down. What does it do to your digestive system? Down. What about your sleep patterns? Down. What about reproductive trends? Down. Okay? Cortisol is a stress hormone that's produced when you're subluxated. Does everybody see that? See the relationship here? You irritate the nervous system. Blood pressure increase, heart rate increase, clotting factors. Down regulates insulin sensitivity. This is heart disease, this is diabetes. Weakens connective tissues. That's falling apart syndrome. How many people have that? FAS. <laughs> Inflam infl inflammation and swelling. Melatonin down regulates sleeping. Stress hormone production. It's a self feeding cycle from subluxation. Where do we see subluxations most commonly with our patients who are struggling with heart disease, specifically heart issues? C1, atlas, top cervical vertebrae. There's a, one of the cranial nerves that drapes right over the front of the atlas, the top bone in your neck, okay? That vagus nerve, it's called, the vagus nerves control the tone of the viscera, the function of your organ systems, specifically influences the heart. We also see problems with T4 through T, T, uh, T4 through T8. Kurt, can you stand up here for me for a second, please? So when we see this kind of case, not this guy, because he's just work of art, right? Nothing wrong, no problems. All right, so when we look at T4 through T7, what we'll typically see here is a person will have forward head posture. Okay, they've lost that healthy curve in their, in, in their neck. So the head's out here in front of them, their shoulders are rounded, right? Because they either sit at a desk all day long, or they do bench work all day long, or they pull lobster traps up, right? So we end up with this roundedness in the upper back. They typically have tight muscles and pain in their upper back from chronic problems and real sensitivity and inflammation between their shoulder blades. Well, these nerves come out of the spine at this level, and they feed the skin of the upper back, the muscles of the upper back, but there's, a, there's nerves that go deep into the body, and they feed the upper lobes of the lung, the stomach, and the heart, specifically the mediastinum. There's a bony, excuse me, you can have seat. There's a muscular cave, thanks buddy. There's a muscular cave that the heart sits in called the mediastinum. It sits, and the heart sits upright, okay? 
Imagine as your posture was like this, and the heart's over like this, and we're rounding out like this. How Everybody do this with me. Flex forward. Now take a big breath without sitting up. Is it harder or easier to breathe that way? Go ahead, take another one. Big breath. Lean over. Is that hard to breathe? What do you think is happening with your heart right now? Your heart sits up and boom, 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 right? Imagine if you're over like this. Imagine the heart beating against itself. Right? You ever hear of congestive heart failure? Okay. These kyphotic issues, people have a high tendency to see heart issues with them. I'll tell you what, we take care of a lot of people, lots and lots of people, all right, uh, 10,000 cases. In 17 years, we've had two patients die from heart attack. Two patients in 17 years, 10,000 cases. Remember what the number one killer is and how many, you know, there's millions of people over that period of time, right? Ask your dentist how many patients a month they lose to heart attacks. The point being is that nerve supply is just so absolutely critical. When you stabilize that spine, take the pressure off the nerve and allow the nervous system to heal the body and adapt readily and appropriately to stressors, we don't see our patients drop and dead heart attacks, okay? Most of the people that we see who have had open heart surgeries, they'll have problems at T6, T7, T8. All right, you'll, you'll see a, a great deal of our patient base in, in the 50 to 65 year range they have had some type of open heart surgery. And the correlation is extraordinary, T6, T7, T8. We see that almost every time with the subluxation patterns in the spine. So what creates subluxation? It's this posture. Dr. Gonsid used to call this the heart attack position sitting in that position all day long, all right? Creating that thoracic subluxation. But how about these kids nowadays? I'm, you know, it's alarming and I'm really concerned about it. Everybody jokes about it, but it's no joke. You should see the x-rays that we see already with these kids. These young kids are in big trouble. You know, they don't, we didn't grow up doing this, right? Any of you guys grew up just such in front of a TV? Never mind sitting here like this. I mean, this is every single kid, all right? You watch even just out in our waiting room. You'll see everybody sitting out there on their phones with their emails and their texts, you know, so, and with their texting. So, I know I sound like an old man when I say that now, but, you know, it's, at the end of the day, I teach the kids, you know what? I want you to sleep on your back and read on your belly. Okay, so think about it. Picture this kid flipped over. I want them to be reading on their belly, okay? So, put a pillow up underneath their chest and get up into extensions so of the next an extension and they can text or read or do their games on their belly sleep on their back. I tell everybody, God put all the bumps on the front, sleep on the back, right? So you get a little extension in the neck. All right, that's what causes subluxation. Everybody thinks subluxation is only related or caused by car accidents and sports injuries and falls downstairs. Guys, obviously that stuff can cause subluxation. Misalign those phones. Make sure that you, you understand that that creates inflammation and nerve irritation, and that happens. Those traumas happen, and they create weaknesses in the body. But it's our chronic, habituated bad habits and unnatural postures, okay? We were never designed to sit all day long, okay? And unfortunately, most people spend all their days sitting, all right? That's what creates that subluxation pattern. So how do you correct subluxation? It's a three-legged stool, very simple. The adjustments, a specific series of chiropractic adjustments will retrain that joint, that bone, back into a healthy position and stabilize the subluxation so that the tissue can heal and bring that swelling down and off the nerve, all right? Very specific series of adjustments will correct that. And those adjustments need to be done in rhythm so we can get ahead of the subluxation pattern. Number two, breaking the bad habits that cause your subluxation in the first place. We don't want to be shoveling sand against the tide. We spend a lot of time trying to teach you guys, hey, this is what creates your subluxation pattern. Stop doing that. So you guys have to play along and break the bad habits. If you don't know what your bad habit is or what habits are leading to your particular subluxation pattern, please ask us. As you know, we love to talk. You know, we'd be happy to teach you. Okay? We want to show you guys because we want to see you making the progress that we want for you and we know you want. Okay? And number three, exercises to strengthen the soft tissue so you hold your adjustments better. Guys, at the end of the day, in order to heal and get the best results, it's all about how long can you hold your adjustments. These two things determine how long you can hold the adjustments. We could deliver world-class care in our office, but if you go out into the world and you keep doing these toxic deficient behaviors, you know, you'll never get where you want to go and where we want you to be, all right? So we will teach you the very specific exercises to strengthen the soft tissues around the subluxation, the muscles around the spine that have been under a, health, under a lot of stress and have gotten fibrotic and weakened and atrophied over time. So those muscles need to have very specific targeted 
exercises that we will design for you and tell you what to do specific to your case so that you can hold your adjustments longer because it's all about holding the adjustments. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so if you are here as a guest, you're probably asking yourself, all right, how do I find, I find, found, find I out know. if I have subluxation in your spine? Well, you're in the right place, all right? So a chiropractor is the unique healthcare professional trained in how to detect and find this pressure in your spinal column and nervous system, and we would love to check you to find out if you have subluxation. All right, you would, as a guest here tonight, uh, you can take advantage of what we offer during our workshops, which is our new patient examination and consultation, which includes any and all necessary x-rays and a report of findings with the doctor. We'll explain you exactly what we found and how we can help you. That is regularly $285, but because you're our guest here tonight, that's just $47. If you'd like to take advantage of that, we would love to do that for you. Talk to one of these handsome men in the back. They've got the new patient scheduled. That's you, Dr. Justin. Uh, and we would love to take care of you. All right, everybody, I hope I answered all your questions. And I am going to stick around to see if you have any other questions. Uh, I, uh, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, not bad. All right, does anybody have any questions? I want to know how you deal with your sleep deprivation. It's a chink in my armor. You guys hear me say that almost every workshop. It's a chink in my armor, you know. Um, I'm teaching internationally, so that really stresses me out. That's a big one for me. Um, you know, I've got doctors that I teach in Australia and Singapore and Malaysia and, you know, the, um, China. I mean, I'm all over the place now. So, I mean, Camilla will look at me cross-eyed on a Sunday and she'll be like, it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday night, and I'm answering an email, and she's like, I'm like, no, it's not. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Australia. <laughs> You're 15 hours ahead. So, yeah, it's a, it's a chink in my armor, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm trying to reconcile that with other strategies, but nothing replaces good sleep. So if you guys uh, check with anybody who knows this place well, they'll tell you we nap here every day. So if you come here at lunchtime, the doors are closed, the lights are off, and the, everything's locked down. For two and a half hours, we break in the day because we start early, right? 6.45 in the morning, uh, and we go late, 6.45 at night. So the whole team crashes. You know, some people work out, some people go for a nice lunch, but everybody pretty much takes a nap. And we do that for about 20, 25 minutes. It looks like somebody gassed the place. Everybody's laying out all over this body. This body's everywhere. All right, any other questions? I, I have a comment. I have yep. pretty bad habits. I, what, so I've been a patient here three years. Yes. And I come in there on crutches, and now I play golf and do all that good stuff. Hallelujah. Um, posture. Posture I see here, even here. Oh, yeah. It's bad posture. Yes. You know, how to sit, how to stand, uh, all the above. And, um, and that's easily correctable. Yep. So are you asking me a question? No, I'm just making a making comment. Making a comment. Because I, I watch, I, when I come in, I especially for these little seminars, I yeah. see you sitting no, well, I mean, you see, you hear me yelling at people because we have the TV up, and one of the doctors will yell out to the people, and you know, I've got that little TV up there. I call that the posture cam, the posture police, right? So I'll yell right through those slat doors, and I'm like, Anthony, are you slouching in my <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you got to work on your posture. Obviously, the seated posture is a huge one. Standing posture is another. Sleeping posture is the third, and the car is the fourth, right? Um, I love what uh, Dr. James Chestnut teaches people about fixing their posture in their car, which is fix your car seat so you know you have perfect posture. Adjust your mirrors so that when your posture is perfect, your mirrors work for you in the car, rear view mirror and side view mirrors. And then when you look up and your mirrors don't work anymore, don't adjust your mirrors, adjust your posture back to where it should be. Makes sense, right? I just have a comment. Thank you for teaching us what you taught us about um, cholesterol and, and the natural process of the body. Just tonight on the news, um, they reported that the prescription or prescribing statins is up, and that's because people just don't know how to to help or treat their bodies. So they just go by what the doctor prescribes. So I was kind of surprised at that because um, it's it's not just older elderly folks. They say it's going even in a younger direction. Yeah, so. there's, there's a Dr. Reckless, believe it or not, that's his name, who suggested that we put statin drugs in the water, the way they put fluoride wow. in. Yeah. He was serious. Think about that. Okay. And everybody understands that the cholesterol is the body's innately intelligent response to low-grade chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, well, what causes low-grade chronic inflammation? Let's address the problem. No, no, let's just put statin drugs in the drinking water. Can you imagine? No. 
Okay, it's the number two selling. Is it the number one or number two? Psychotropic drugs are number one, right? So maybe those two run hand in hand. What do you think? You know. Mm. So we got psychotropic drugs and statin drugs. You know, it's it's a fifteen billion dollar industry in the U.S. alone. I think it's twenty eight billion worldwide. It's, it's incredible, right? So yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I mean, there are so many things that we can do, all right? And you know, statin drugs. Certain. I mean, statin drugs have some effectiveness. There's is, is a is a place for it, right? Uh, they, they certainly have been shown to reduce the occurrence of second heart attacks in people who have had one heart attack. Um, but they, it's meant to be a last resort after lifestyle changes. You know, they're they're they, If you want to read a good study, the internet, uh, the inner heart study. Uh, you can get this in PubMed, it's right online. It says it's 90% lifestyle. So there's a 90% lifestyle influence and a 10% genetic influence. Right? Now it's going us the 6 o'clock news, which will make you stressed out. And then, and the then all the advertisements. All the statin drugs are advertised. Yeah. Right. And right. And right. Notice right. how long those commercials yeah. are getting with all, the, all the side effects. Yeah. You know, the side effects yeah. of statin drugs, you know, six okay. liver, muscle, and GI damage. Okay, so now we're treating those other issues, right? So, you know, I know you guys always want to know what supplements I recommend that you should take if we're going to have an outside-in conversation. You know, you've got to take your fish oil, all right? You've got to do your antioxidants, plant sterols, coenzyme Q10, niacin is great for blood pressure, uh, fully. So these are supplements that, uh, this is, these are things that we supplement into our life to help combat some of the things that we do that we know we're walking with a limp, like our sleep patterns or the stresses of our lives or long-term supplementation patterns in our body. We put all these good things together, we add exercise, we clear up our sleep patterns, right? Clear up our thought life and our coping mechanisms. Clean up your diet style, right? Your movement patterns. All of these things, guys, these are the facets that add up to a healthier you. It's every choice, every day. How you don't do you get change, healthy, you do healthy. How do you change your sleep habits? Your, the position you sleep in at night? I mean, I Stay out of those singles bars, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I sat out on my back and I wake up, I'm back on my stomach with my arms and my Duct tape I works. Move. Yeah. You, yeah. Know what, you know what you can do is Dr. Gonstead. What Gonstead's happens when I have to get up to go to the bathroom <laughs> if I'm duct taped? <laughs> get your catheter. So the, Dr. Gonstead used to tell you, Plastic take sheets. a, take a uh, bathrobe and tie a big double knot. So you have a big double knot. Um, a bathrobe tie around your belly, so if you rolled over, it would wake you up. That was one way to do it. I tell people to duct tape a pine cone to your belly, and it wake you up. <laughs> um, I, I like, I mean, I take a gorgeous blonde and I wedge her into my side like that, and that keeps me from going that way. <laughs> That's my wife, guys. All right, and what I like to do is I'll take a big pillow, put it up underneath my knees, and a thin down pillow, put it up underneath my neck, and I take the blanket, and I pull it, and I pull it tight to my side, so, um, you know, I'm in basically like the coffin position. But I'll wake, I'll wake up in that position too. So you can train yourself to sleep in better positions. For sure. For sure. And if you know, if you're sleeping next to a chiropractor, she'll elbow you in the ribs if you flip over. She's always looking out for Question on fish oil. Um, the omega-3s, there's something I read on creel oil. Krill. Krill oil. Yeah. They said that it's a um, stronger or better. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a marketing position for everything, right? So okay. it's omega-3 fatty acids. What you're looking for is the EPA and DHA. Okay. Fish oil is the best source of that. <coughs> okay, the, the report said something about taking a combination of the two because the biggest mammal, the whale, that's what they feed on. Yeah, and everybody knows whales don't get heart disease, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you should, the biggest, whale, you want to be big like a whale, take krill. Yeah, no, it's, it's, there's a always a marketing story. Okay. There's always a marketing story. I mean, our company produces... Uh, fish oil. So we could, when it came to Bonfire, we could have done anything, right? We could have produced whatever we wanted. So we combed through the literature and we said, what's the best approach here? Would it be krill? I think krill is a potentially more environmentally sustainable solution in the future. I also think algae is something we'll go to in the mm -hmm. future. Okay? But the best source of EPA and DHA, which is what you want, is fish oil. Okay? The fish eat the krill, process the EPA and DHA. Okay? So bioavailability. Last question. I had a question. Uh, I can't remember the author, but I just grabbed the book, uh, The Cholesterol Myth, mm -hmm. and I've only read a, a page here and there, or a chapter here and there, I jumped around. And I'm going to read it straight through, but it's addressing how cholesterol is not the big problem. They talk about how sugar is a big problem. Yeah. Have you read that book? I mean, it's been yeah. around for a while. Yeah. So remember, this is what creates irritation. Irritation is the problem. 
Cholesterol is not the problem. Irritation is the problem. Now, do some people have familial genetic elevated cholesterol? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I've got patients who have four and five hundred for a cholesterol number. Wow. Wow. Okay. So when people have two ten, and their medical doctor says, "Well, you know, it's genetic," no, it's not. Okay. And, oh, yeah, heart disease runs in my family. No, the problem is nobody runs in your family. That's an issue. Okay. So that those are those aren't the people that I'm, you know, saying, oh yeah, it's, it's a genetic. It's, it's always there are there are small percentages of people that have genetic issues and they make big stories out of them. Mm. Okay? A fifteen billion dollar story. Mm. Does that help? So remember Yeah, I know, I was just trying to pass it on. I'm gonna read the book. I just thought <coughs> what you thought of it as a general knowledge. Well when we say the cholesterol myth, is it is it part of this whole syndrome? Yes. Is it important? Yes. But it's an innately res intelligent response from your body, okay, to a problem. The problem is the lifestyle that creates the low-grade inflammation. Address the problem. Are we now faced with a, a society that doesn't like to address the real problems yeah. and patch everything up and cover it all up and take a pill and get back to the lifestyle that's killing you? In every category, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. In every category. So do you think this is le leading to the number one cause of death? Of course it is, right? So instead of just treating the symptoms, the downstream effects of the body, of, of your lifestyle choices. Look and see what's creating this low-grade inflammation. You know, it's at the root of the problem. Can we influence our blood pressure? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you can. Can we influence our blood sugar levels? Yes or no? Yes. We know 20 ways to do that, right? How about toxins? Can you make choices around the toxins that are floating around your bloodstream? You can. Okay. You carry an amazing genome. You come from a long line of incredibly successful human beings. When you hear somebody say something runs in your family, remember, I've got two of my goddaughters that have cystic fibrosis. I know what a genetic disease is, okay? So that is a very, very small percentage of, your, of the populace. 99.6% of us have the ideal genome that I put in the right environment over time will yield optimal health. That's what you're hardwired for. You're hardwired to be healthy. All right, guys. Such a pleasure to have you here tonight. If anybody would like to go to get their spine checked to see if you've got stress on your nervous system that's leading to that elevated cortisol, which may be at the root of your heart disease, please talk to one of the doctors. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.